Truly, there is nothing that makes sense about the love of God. He just chose to love us for no good reason. We didn't earn it. We surely didn't deserve it. It's extravagant. And never has it been more obviously extravagant than 2,000 years ago on Good Friday. That's the, the moment that we knew what his full plan was to give his life for us. It all began back in the upper room. Jesus is with his disciples, and, and that was the night when he knelt to wash everyone's feet, even the filth off of Judas's feet who would betray him. And he shared with them the very first Lord's Supper. He took bread and he broke it and he said, this bread, this is like my body that's broken for you. And he challenged them to eat and receive it. And then he took the wine and he said, this cup, this is the new covenant in my blood, drink it and receive it. Now from that place, Judas left and he betrayed Jesus. And the soldiers came back with him and they found Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane where he had, he had been praying and, and, and the, the, the temple guards took Jesus away. And that's that famous moment where Peter draws his sword on the temple guard Malchus and he swings at him. I don't think he was aiming for his ear. <laughs> probably missed his neck, but he took his ear off. And Jesus just kept being Jesus in his own personal crisis when he had been praying until he sweat great drops of blood, the most agonizing part of his 33 years. It's his own personal crisis. Some of you are in a crisis right now. Isn't it good to know that Jesus doesn't stop being Jesus in a crisis? He, he stooped down and he picked up the severed ear of the guard who would take him to his own death. And he healed him. He put his ear back on him. He healed him. There they took Jesus and they put him in a basically in a basement or an underground, uh, like, a, like a, a house arrest. I've been in that basement in the bottom of a house in Israel. I shared probably one of the greatest worship moments of my life just down in that hole that, that they know a lot of places in Israel, they think this happened here and this might have happened there. Historians and, and Bible scholars are almost certain that they know where Jesus spent that night. And I've been there and I've had a worship moment that was just so powerful. After he spent that night there, they took him out and they brought him before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. And there, the Jews demanded that he be crucified. And so Pilate gave them what they wanted. He was condemned to death. And then the Roman soldiers took him and they put him on a, a, a post, a whipping post. And there they took a piece of wood, a handle that had a, what they called a cat of nine tails, nine long pieces of, of, uh, of, of, of rope, leather, that and at the end of each piece had sharp objects like like, like metal and, and glass and rock. And they beat Jesus 39 times, times nine straps. And with each blow, those long straps would begin by hitting his back and wrap around to his side, to his exposed ribs. And that jagged edge would dig deep into his skin. And as they pulled it back, they would expose his ribs and even possibly his organs. From there, he traveled down the Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering. And, and, and some scholars and, and, and uh, medical people who studied the history say the first miracle is the miracle that Jesus even survived that beating. But survived it, he did. And then he took his cross on his back and he carried it up to Golgotha, the place of the skull, on a mountain range that is the exact same place that 3,000 years earlier, Abraham took his only son, Isaac. He put wood on Isaac's back and Isaac carried it up that same mountain. He laid Isaac on the wood, much like they would lay Jesus on the wood. And when the angel of the Lord stopped him from taking his own son's life, they found a ram. They found a lamb who would take the place of Isaac. And now 3,000 years later on the same place, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world willingly laid on that cross where they drove spikes through his hands and feet and he died on that cross. And you know, as much as many have blamed the Jews 
for condemning Jesus or the Romans for killing Jesus. The fact of the matter is, I killed Jesus. You killed Jesus. It was our sins that put him on the cross, and so we're all guilty of crucifying the Savior of the world. In fact, if you read Scripture, it even seems like God himself was complicit with the death of Jesus. Because 700 years before Jesus' death, a writer named Isaiah prophesied exactly how it would all happen. And in Isaiah 53, verse 9, he, he writes these words, Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. The Father wanted him to die because he knew that there would be a sin problem, that I would have a sin problem that I could never fix. I could feel guilty and I could feel ashamed and I could be very sorry, but I could never make myself not be a sinner. I would need a savior. So he prepared his son to die for the sins of the world. And as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper together, and I want to remind you, we're going to do that together across this video screen. I want you to share in the Lord's Supper. Find a piece of bread and a piece of wine, a cracker, some juice, some wine, whatever you can get your hands on. It's a symbol. It, it, it's not really the element that matters. It's the symbol of it. But as we prepare to do that, I want to tell you what the prophet Isaiah said centuries before when he predicted what would happen in that same Isaiah chapter uh, 53 and verse 5. One verse tells us four places Jesus was punished for you. It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was laid on him and by his wounds we are healed. The first place said he was pierced. Now the piercing of Jesus took place in his hands and his feet. And it represents the things we do. Each of us have let our feet take us places we didn't belong and let our hands do things we should never have done. And when Jesus held out his hands to be pierced for you, he knew. He knew of your sin. He knew you couldn't overcome it and he paid the price for it. And so there's no shame left. He took all that shame to the cross and today you can accept his love and be forgiven for all the things you've done. He goes on and says, he was crushed for our iniquities. Now the part of Jesus' body that was crushed was his heart. He literally, he, he literally, his heart was crushed by the weight of hanging on that cross. And that represents all of the emotional pain, all of the emotional wounds that you've gone through, all of the injustice of the world. Jesus paid for all of that. If you're dealing with anxiety and fear, if you're dealing with emotional wounds, know that the, the payment, the, the healing of all of that has already been cared for at the cross. And before we finish this worship experience tonight, I want you to pray and believe for your forgiveness and your healing. The third way that Jesus was punished was, was through the crown of thorns. When it says the punishment that brought us peace was placed on him. Literally, they placed on him a crown of thorns. Now, I've been to the place. I've seen those kinds of thorns. They're, they're about the size of your pinky. They were thrust into his head, and he would have bled profusely out of his head. The Bible says that punishment was placed at this part of his body for your peace of mind. Think about it. Isn't that where peace resides or where we lose peace? Isn't this in our mind where anxiety and fear overtakes us and we wonder, what about this disease, this virus? What about my job? What about the mortgage payment? What about my kids? And, and all of that fear begins to just well up inside of us. Listen, Jesus went to the cross so that you could have peace of mind. I want you tonight to just receive the peace of God. Wherever you are, in a moment when we pray, I want you to accept the peace of God. And then finally, the scripture says, and by his wounds, we are healed. 
This is to remind us, it was again predicted centuries before it happened, but today it reminds us of how they struck his back time and time again. You know, a man's back is the strongest part of his body. And you see, sickness robs us of all that strength. Jesus took wounds on his back so that you could have your strength. Any disease, any sickness, anything that would rob you of your health and your strength has already been paid for. I hope you hear my heart today in 2020. I know he's the healer of all diseases, cancer, diabetes, every blood disease, including COVID-19 is covered by the blood of Jesus. Can you receive that tonight? Can you just believe that with me, that your healing, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to quote all the Bible verses. It's already been paid for by the blood of Jesus. And so when we pray right now, before we take the Lord's communion together, when we pray right now, I want you to prepare yourself for communion. I want you to accept the blood of Jesus washing you from your sins. I want you to accept the healing of Jesus, the healing of your mind and the the, the peace that rolls in its place and the healing of your body, the health that takes the place of the disease right there where you are with your family. Would you bow your heads and agree with this prayer with me now? Father, thank you for having the infinite wisdom of sending your son Jesus to be wounded for us, God to be pierced for our transgressions and and be crushed for our iniquities. Thank you, Lord, for placing on him the punishment that brings peace to us. And thank you for healing us by the stripes on his back. And right now in this moment, God, we accept forgiveness from our sins and we receive healing of all sickness. It is ours and we thank you for the blood of Jesus. Amen.